Well, now that we've finished describing reality using the categories, Aristotle wants to move from the description to uh, what's going on or what's real. And this is where we start talking about the problem of metaphysics. Now, when, when we're talking about the problem of metaphysics, uh, the way it's dealt with in the book and the way that Aristotle deals with, uh, another way to understand this is the question of metaphysics. And what that means is, uh, what question are we trying to answer when we're dealing with metaphysics? So to think about this, you know, think about uh, questions in other fields. So I've already given some kind of like off-the-cuff uh, responses as, as to what these different fields study. So if we're dealing with the physical sciences, uh, the question that's being asked is, what are the causal relationships between material objects? If we're dealing with mathematics, uh, what are the relationships between quantities? You know, if we're dealing with, um, say, history, uh, what events have happened and what are the reasons or the explanations for those events. And these all have kind of a general form. And the general form is uh, what are, you know, objects of this kind or what are the things of this kind and what uh, and why do they happen? So with uh, physical sciences, the question is, well, what are the physical objects? And uh, with the why, we're looking for, well, what are the causal relationships between material objects? Now, something to note is that the physical sciences don't ask about relationships that we we'll deal with in metaphysics or in history. Right? Or, you know, if we're dealing with English, right, what are, you know, what is, um, what is a piece of written work and uh, how can it be evaluated, right? That would be something that would deal with in, in English, but that's not what's happening in the physical sciences. So there's this kind of division. You know, in history, you know, the objects or the things that they're dealing with are, are the events. These are the subjects or the, uh, the objects of study for history. And then the explanation or the why, well, that's going to deal with what kinds of relationships exist between events, right? Uh, history won't necessarily involve causal relationships with two material objects. Sometimes, but not always. Sometimes it's with human motivation and psychological reasons. Right? Um, mathematics, same thing. Uh, mathematics deals with relationships between quantities, but these are specific kinds of relationships, uh, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, we can kind of go on from there. Right? So when you're dealing with a question or a problem within a particular field to dealing with objects of a particular kind or things of a particular kind and relationships that exist between those things. It would be strange in the physical sciences to start asking what beauty is in a poem. Right? That's appropriate for English, not so for sciences. Well, this leads us to metaphysics. Metaphysics is broader than these other more specific questions, these other more specific fields. Metaphysics, as, as Aristotle is dealing with, is you know, metaphysics is dealing with real things. Not just some, but all real things. Right? Right, you know, so where physics deals with material objects, history deals with events, mathematics deals with quantities, metaphysics deals with all of them. And we can go on further. You know, what does it mean to be a poem? What does it mean to be a novel? What does it mean to be a beautiful poem or to have beauty in those written forms? What does it mean to be a piece of art? What does it uh, mean to be a beautiful piece of art? Mm -hmm. Metaphysics deals with all of it. There's nothing outside the purview of metaphysics. Right? So this question... Remember the general form of the, of the question when we're dealing with all these particular, with all these specific kinds of questions is what is it to be things of this kind and what are the relationships, you know, what, what's going to explain the relationships between them? Well, the problem of metaphysics is much broader. The problem of metaphysics is what is it to be? What is it to be an existing thing? That's the first part. And the second part is why does it exist? Aristotle's categories are going to uh, attempt an answer to both of those parts. And in this video, we're going to deal with the first part. You know, what is it to be? And the categories are going to have a very direct answer for that. So we were talking about the categories in the previous video. 
Now, I don't know if you picked up on this, but there's a very important point that you have to get when talking with the categories. So remember what's going on. We're dealing with substance and with accident, or another way of saying this is we're dealing with subject and predicate. So you have uh, substance and accident, or you might even say you know, substance and predicate, you can start mixing and matching there, but that might get confusing real fast. Now the predicates describe the substance. And the substance is what is described. So those are three important points there. We're dealing with substance of predicate, or substance and accident. Um, substance is what is described. Predicate is what describes. Well, there's something that follows from this. Predicates do not describe themselves. All right? Predicates do not describe themselves. So to think of a, re a really kind of a simple example, consider the predicate red. Or actually, since we're out here, <laughs> consider the predicate green. All right? So these trees back here are green. Um, there's several bushes and there's grass that's green. Now the predicate green does not describe itself. The predicate itself is not green. I know this sounds strange to you, but the predicate itself is not green. The trees, the bushes, the grass, that's green. But the predicate itself is not. Take this one step at a time. Here we have several shades of green, right? Uh, we got some dark greens in the shadows. We got some almost yellow greens where the light is striking the green. Uh, we got some almost pale green with the grass because it, it's got some more uh, browns in it, so it's, it's not as vibrant a green as the rest. Um, we can start going on and on. And uh, you know, here I've provided. A, a spectrum of green. Right? We've got several shades of green happening right here. Now suppose we say that the predicate green does describe itself. That means that one of these shades of green is the predicate green. Okay? Well what does this mean? Well none of these shades are identical to each other. In fact, you know, we can even become, we can even produce more shades when we start talking about shade in between <laughs> two of them, right? It can get, you can have many shades of green real fast. But if green is one of those shades and that shade is not identical to the rest, then the rest of these shades are not green. They're something else. The rest of the shades are green. There's something else. Green is not any one of these particular shades. It's not any particular shade in the trees here. Green is what all these shades have in common. Green is what they all have in common. But that doesn't look like any particular shade of green. Green is what they have in common. The predicate green is itself not green. The predicate green is what all green things have in common. So right now, I ask you to imagine the predicate green. You're not imagining the predicate green, you're imagining a particular shade of green. <laughs> right? So again, look at the shades that we have here. It's not any one of these shades, it's what they all have in common. Now, now what is it? Well, remember Plato and Aristotle's carrying on with this. <coughs> You know, the predicate green, what's, what's really real there, is not the appearance. Right? So it's not something you see. It's what you comprehend. What you comprehend is what all the shades of green have in common. I don't know if that was quite confusing enough for you, but I can try some, <laughs> some other way. Again, think of squares. So here we have some squares. Squares, yeah, the, the, you know, the, the predicate square Right? Or what it means to be a square is not any individual one of these squares. It's what they all have in common. Well, what are we supposed to carry from this? Well, the predicates do not predicate themselves. Okay. So when the predicates predicate the subject, the subject is not identical to the predicates. I'll say that again. The subject is not identical to the predicates. So looking out here, 
when we have these trees, we have green, we have rough bark, we have, uh, you know, the, we could talk about the structure of the tree. Start thinking about the categories, the structure of the tree, its place, its, uh, you know, it, its time. Um, we can look at it mathematically. We start quantifying it. We could talk about its relation to the other trees, right? These are all the predicates of the tree, but the tree is not identical to those predicates. There's something else, right? but it's not identical to the predicates. So this is a really important point to remember. S the substance, so we have substance and accident. Substance is not just the accidents. It's not just the collection of accidents. Right? There's something else. What this means is, is that the substance is what is described by the accidents. But the substance is not identical to the collection of accidents. So the, there are these trees out here, and we can have the collection of the accidents. The green, the branches, the height, its place, the time. We can have all that collection of accidents. But the substance is something else. It's what is described by the accidents. So this is a really important point to remember here with Aristotle. Same thing happens with Plato, too. The substance is not just the collection of accidents. Well, so you probably and rightfully ask right now, well, what the heck is substance then? And that's the question, right? Um, for Aristotle, just to kind of preview or forecast here, Aristotle, uh, the first part of, of the problem of metaphysics is what does it mean to be and uh, what explains or what causes that being. And for Aristotle, uh, the first part of that question, what does it mean to be? Well, it means to be a substance. That's what exists, are substances. So what are they? Well, let's, before we dive into that, let's take a step back for a second, and I want to return to the accidents for a second. All right. Now, um, some of these accidents we are, some accidents with, with particular things, with, with, these, with these things that exist around us, are essential to these things. So when we're dealing with uh, these trees here, right? you know, if it's a healthy tree, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the cedar trees and some of the oaks, if it's a healthy tree, if it's a living tree, an existing tree, uh, then it has green, right? especially with the evergreens. Uh, the needles are going to be green. They're not going to be uh, maroon. They're not going to be uh, black. You know, maybe you can, you can start pushing the point and say, okay, when the tree is dying, then the needles are going to die and turn black. Okay, you know, that, that, that's fair. But the, the point to get across here, though, is that what's essential to that tree, you know, it's a living, it's a vibrant tree, is that the needles are green, right? Green is essential to the tree. What else is essential to the tree? Well, with uh, cedar trees, they have a particular kind of bark that's essential to the cedar tree. It's, it's more strip-like. You can, you can kind of take off the bark. So, so looking at this cedar tree here, we have this bark. It's very strip-like. It can be uh, kind of taken off in strips, right? That's essential to a cedar tree. That's essential, that's essential uh, for the bark of a cedar tree. When we're dealing with trees like oak, the bark is different. It's uh, you know, it's more block-like is the way that I describe it. You know, it, you, you pull it off in little pieces, right? So that, that's essential to the cedar tree. Well, this is an accident. It is an accident. It's a predicate. It's a description of the cedar tree. But because of the kind of thing it is, right, it has that kind of bark. Now, it's going to vary from tree to tree, sure. But there are even going to be things that are essential to be a tree. So, needing water. Right, that's essential to a tree. Um, needing, uh, I think it's, again, I'm showing my ignorance about in uh, uh, botany here. Uh, trees are going to require carbon monoxide to process into oxygen. Um, they're going to need certain minerals and nutrients from the ground. They're going to need to be rooted in the ground. I believe that's an essential characteristic of a tree is that it has roots. Right. Um, so these are essential to the tree, meaning it can't vary, right? You, or you can't black this thing and still be a tree. So that's what an essential accident is. It's, you know, it's a predicate, it's an accident, 
uh, or essential predicate, I should say. Uh, an essential predicate is a predicate that can't fail to be with that kind of thing. Um, there are essential predicates and there are accidental predicates. Right? So, um, you know, these trees around us, for instance, they have a certain number of branches. Now, you know, there might be a range in which they have to be, but, you know, say the range begins at 5 and ends at uh, 105. Right? Uh, you might, you know, the tree has to have between 5 and 105 uh, branches. But, you know, any particular number in there, that's not essential. It can have, some of these trees have 40 branches, some of them have 25. Um, the, you know, the number, so that's an accident, right? I talk about the quantity. The number of branches uh, is, is accidental to the tree. It can, it can have a variety of different uh, predicates there. Um, you know, just take me, right? There are lots of accidental pro uh, properties, or predicates, excuse me, lots of accidental predicates about me right now. So one of the categories is possession, and I'm wearing a black shirt. I have a black shirt. Well, I have lots of shirts, right? I could be wearing one of my red shirts. I could be wearing uh, that, uh, <laughs> that shirt that caused every problems, whether it's maroon or black or brown or whatever it was. Um, I have a blue shirt, right? The, you know, you know, that possession, well, that's accidental. I could, be, I could have a variety of shirts. I, I could even be shirtless right now. I'm not going to do that, <laughs> right? Even having a shirt is not essential. I, I can still be what I am and not wear a shirt. So this is the distinction between essential predicates and accidental predicates. An essential predicate is what a thing has to have because of the kind of thing it is. And an accidental predicate is pretty much any other predicate. You know, you can have this predicate or not and still be the kind of thing it is. So I'm human. Right? I, you know, one of the essential predicates of me is that I'm human. I can't be me and be a reptile. Right? Uh, and since I'm human, one of the essential predicates of being human is being warm-blooded. Right? So that's an essential predicate. Right? Um, but there's lots of ways that a human being can exist. For instance, uh, you know, human beings can exist in the United States and they can exist in Mexico and in the Philippines and Africa, right? So they were talking about place there. Human beings can exist in a wide variety of places. Well, that, that would be accidental. Well, what's essential would be warm-blooded. So now we have another distinction. We have a distinction between form and matter. And this should be pretty familiar to you by now. The, uh, again, we're appealing to Pythagoras, right? The form is the universal, it's the definition, it's the essence of the thing. And the matter is, you know, the stuff. Now, Aristotle takes it a little bit further. Um, you know, where lots of, th lots of things can be matter without necessarily being physical. So, for instance, um, matter, uh, you know, we were appealing to this idea of this distinction between form and matter before. Form is the kind of thing that it is, and matter is uh, what composes it, right? Matter is the composition. What, what, what do you put together to make the thing? And the form is the kind of thing. So part of my form is human, um, philosopher, right? Um, you know, we could start throwing in other things. Male, right? This is, this is all part of my form. These are the kinds of things that I am. The matter, in turn, is, is what, com what, what comes together to make that. Right? So matter, again, we're, you know, for appealing to like physical, well, it's also going to be, uh, you know, flesh, bone, muscle, blood. Right? But also part of that will be my experiences. Right? This isn't necessarily physical. Maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, that's subject for debate. But all but this comes together to make the to uh, comes together for the kind of thing that I am. Okay. Uh, my education. Okay. Uh, I am amongst other things a philosopher. Well, the, my, you know the particulars of my education come together to make that kind of thing, to make me a philosopher. That's what composes uh, my being a philosopher. So form is, is the kind of thing, it's the universal, it's the abstract, it's the essence, it's the definition, it's the meaning. 
matter is what composes, what comes together to make that kind of thing. Not only the physical, but you know, events in history, um, uh, uh, per, you know, personal experiences, uh, thoughts, and beliefs. So, you know, a philosopher is a particular kind of person, but there's a wide variety of thoughts and beliefs that can that can come together to compose philosopher. Just ask the variety of philosophers that are out there. <laughs> um, so, so Aristotle makes this distinction there between the form and the matter. Um, now, it's it's a fair question to ask: well, What's the relationship between the essential predicates and you know the essential and accidental predicates and form and matter? And um, you know, it's kind of hard to nail this down, but a, a handy way to start to think about it is that the essential predicates right, are the form. The essential predicates are the form, and the accidental predicates, well, that, that's the matter. Right? That could come together to be, you know, to compose that kind of thing. Now we might push on that in class, so don't take that as, you know, just a hardline answer right now, but it's, it's a way of trying to think about that answer. So this is what we talked about. We talked about uh, substance and accident, about the subject and the predicate. And this is supposed to help us answer the problem metaphysics, metaphysics which is what does it mean to be and what's the cause of the, or what's the cause of the explanation of that being. And we've been dealing with substance, and substance is not the same thing as the predicate. Right? Predicate is what describes the substance, substance is not the same thing as a predicate. So we're real familiar with predicates, we're real familiar with descriptions, so what does it mean to be that substance? Well, we've also been dealing with form and we've been dealing with matter. So how is Aristotle going to ask, answer this question? He's going to, he wants to answer the question, what does it mean to be, what does it mean to exist? What's his answer? Don't you figure it out yet? The problem of metaphysics is what does it mean to be? What exists? Aristotle is focusing on substance. The question is what is substance? Well, substance is a composite of form and matter. Substance is the composite of form and matter. These two things come together, the kind of thing and what composes the thing, and that's what exists. A kind of thing and the composite and what composes the thing, that's what exists. So looking at these here, these are substances. There's the kind of thing, and it's, the kind of thing is it's a tree, it's a cedar tree. And there's the matter. I mean, that particular grouping of bark and minerals and water and sap. It's location, right? All of the categories coming together, that's the matter of the thing. Where is it? How long has it been here? Uh, what's its relation to other things? All of that is the matter. So what exists is substance. What substance is a composite of form and matter. Form is the universal, it's the kind of thing. Matter is what composes it. What composes it uh, to make that kind of thing. Now this is going to have some serious implications which are very different from Plato's view. So ask yourself for Plato, you know, what exists, or you might even ask yourself what's the most real thing for Plato? Is it the particular objects or is it the form? Well, for Plato, what's most real is the form. For Plato, what's most real is the form. Therefore, for Plato, you can have form without matter. As a matter of fact, that's the most real thing, is form without matter. Aristotle disagrees. What's real is substance. Now, what is substance is a composite of form and matter. You can't separate the form from the substance. You do that, you don't have a real thing anymore. Same thing is true with the matter, right? So if you're dealing with uh, Anaximander, where he's talking about the boundless, that's matter without form. Aristotle says you can't do that either because what exists is substance and what is substance is a composite of form and matter. So the boundless doesn't exist for Aristotle. It's, it's, there has to be, if there's matter, there has to be form. Um, 
this is a pretty different view than Plato. Still appealing to some of the same ideas though. You know, Aristotle still wants to hang on to universals. And the reason why he wants to hang out to universals is uh, because we can't do, for instance, any science without universals. If I can't talk about tree as a kind of thing, I cannot study trees. Right? I'll study that and that and that and that and that. But if there's nothing that they have in common, I'm just studying five individual things. I'm not studying tree. Same thing with gravity. Ma uh, you know, if, if we're going to talk about physical objects, I'm going to deal with that too. Uh, you know, you still, you know, so if we're dealing with protons, neutrons, and electrons, well, as many talk about proton, neutron, electron, you're dealing with a form. Right? Uh, so you can't do away with form. Um, Aristotle's answer is pretty different. We got, uh, you know, the answer to the question of what does it mean to be? The answer is, it's to be substance. What does it mean to be substance? It's to be a composite of form and matter. And the categories come in. When we start, again, we, you know, we might question this later on, but at least the way to start thinking about it is, you know, what's the form? Well, that's the essential predicates. And what's the matter? Well, that's the accidental predicates. We'll push on that in class, but that's at least a way to start thinking about it. So this is the answer to the first part of the question, the problem of metaphysics. In the next video, uh, you remember the question, the problem of metaphysics is what does it mean to be and why? What's the cause, the explanation of that being? Well, the next video deals with the why.